Ken, I will hand it off to you. Thank you, Ashley. I always appreciate your uh, your introductions and all your support doing this work. I love this webinar series. I'm excited to see you all. Thank you for spending your lunch uh, with us uh, chatting. I'm excited to be with Emily. Um, Emily is one of our fantastic newer additions to the Management and Entrepreneurship Program. Uh, and I knocked on her door and said, please, please uh, present with me because uh, she's just fantastic. So you get a chance to, uh, to get just a, a little flavor for some of the amazing um, younger faculty we have as you have to sort of struggle with me as one of our more established faculty. So decision making. Uh, this is something we deal with every single day. And uh, Emily, if you want to, you know, we've got this sort of image. Uh, every morning we wake up uh, and we make a lot of decisions. A lot of those decisions are what we call program decisions. They're habitual. We don't have to really think about them. The alarm clock goes off. You get up. You have routines and rituals that you engage in. Uh, for the most part, you get up. You know you have to go to work. Uh, these are program decisions. I had a program decision this morning in addition to getting up, uh, which is that um, I gave blood. Um, and that's a program decision for me because I get reminders from the local DeGowan Blood Center. Um, and they also give me great swag. Um, so I've got my donor life, um, which if we can get it to focus, it says donor life is the best life. Um, so I get the notice from them that I'm eligible and I sign up and I go. So that's a program decision. When we talk about problem solving, and in particular, innovative problem solving, we're going to be talking about non-program decisions, decisions that are not automatic. Um, when I was giving blood, the guy next to me was a student, actually a tippy student. The blood drive was sponsored by Delta Sigma Pi, and he was a Delta Sigma Pi member. And he, he came because he's a DSP member and he wanted to be supportive, but he'd never given blood before. So for him, this decision was not programmed. He did not wake up and go, I'm just going to do what I always do. He had to make a decision and he had to weigh a number of factors. How scared am I? How nervous am I? Do I have, you know, is it likely that I'll be rejected? Uh, and I, he was very courageous. Um, he did almost pass out and I gave him a drive to, to come get to W10. So I assume he's doing okay downstairs in W10 right now. He seemed fine um, when I dropped him off, uh, but that was absolutely a non-program decision, and that will be our focus today is non-program decisions. And I want to ask you, you know, Emily and I really want to get a taste for what you're thinking right now. So what non-program decisions, what no non-program decisions are you facing right now? A problem, a challenge, a, a decision that you've never had to make before that's new to you. And, and for this one, we will have you use the chat. So use the chat pop into there and just give us a phrase so we can get a sense. We have three examples primed to talk about a decision-making model that we think will benefit you that's an integration of a lot of the research and expertise that folks have about decision-making. Uh, so we have three examples, but we wanna hear from you and maybe uh, we'll be able to adjust our examples or just uh, you know pull in some of yours. So please feel free, use that chat. Put your answers, as Ashley has said um, there, what non-program decisions are you struggling with, facing, or worried about right now? So, oh, the chat's disabled. So there was a, a program decision that we need to make. We need to... <laughs> I'm so, working on that now. Hold on, okay. hold on. Let me, let me try and manage that. All right. So Ashley has not one, but two sick kids. So she's juggling multiple things. So uh, thanks, we'll get to that. Let's go ahead and keep that in mind. Once the chat uh, uh, gets uh, open, you can drop it in there. And I see some names I recognize. Uh, John, I see you. So I am curious what non-program decision you're facing with all the, the businesses that you're starting and working through. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about how we understand decision-making. And we're gonna frame this. Okay, chat's enabled, so please go ahead and, and type that in there as I'm presenting and going through the basics. So for those of you who may remember uh, in your MBA program, you're um, managing people and organizations or your intro to management class. Uh, we talk often about there being three primary means or methods that people make decisions, uh, rational, intuitive, and satisficing. Um, and we're going to talk just briefly about each of these so you have a sense for um, uh, what they are, what they're like. 
um, high level overview, rational decision making is that type of decision making that you take a lot of time and effort to use and you think through um, what is it that you're trying to solve, the nature of the problem, the criteria, and you're using a lot of the prefrontal cortex, you're heavily engaged in uh, effortful thinking and weighing of options. Now, in contrast, intuitive decision making is much more holistic. And in fact, we tend to use um, the more basic parts of our brain because we're listening to emotion and those kind of almost non-rational, uh, heavily um, kind of those, those impulses that come, sometimes we refer to them as, as gut, uh, but really these are things that are happening uh, in all parts of our brain, not just in the prefrontal cortex. So, and then the third is satisficing. And in fact, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that satisficing is pretty common. Um, satisficing uh, is um, when we take some shortcuts. So um, we're not being fully intuitive, and, but we're not being fully rational either. So um, let's jump into these and I'm gonna turn it over to Emily, who's gonna talk about rational decision-making. First, we're, we want to know how you may typically make non-program decisions of these three types. We're just curious. Uh, there, there's lots of uh, lots of different ways to think about um, non-program decisions. Uh, we have a poll coming up, maybe Ashley. There it is. We'll give you guys just about a minute, maybe, to indicate your responses. So again, we've got rational decision making. I'll go over that in a moment. I have a sneaky feeling we think we do that more than we do. Intuitive decision making, as Ken was saying, you know, following our intuition, maybe a little more feelings approach. Uh, satisficing, which is a pretty fun concept we'll talk about. And then whatever my boss tells me to do. And we've got three people saying whatever their boss decides to do. These are probably our most successful and most recently reported attendees, uh, um, sort of promoted and, and being successful. Uh, but rational is coming up very high, right? Uh, the majority of folks, in fact, close to two thirds are saying, you know, that they typically try to make decisions uh, using a rational decision-making model. Mm -hmm. Emily, is that what you expected? Pretty high on rational? It is, it is. And I, I'm not bothered by that at all, right? We try, we, we like to think we're incredibly rational beings. And and it, the, the point we're, we're gonna eventually get to is that we tend to use a mix or we tend to, you know, float from one type to the other as is needed, which I know, Ken, you're gonna talk about that. But let's talk about the rational decision-making model. This model, uh, it, it comprises a series of steps that we take sequentially. And this is really important to remember as we think about this process to maximize our output. And because this is an economic model, when we talk about maximizing, we're really talking about uh, maximizing economic output, not just any output. And also because this comes from economics, not to not to diss any of my 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 uh, econ friends, but it makes some assumptions that at the individual level feel unattainable. And we'll talk about what some of those assumptions are as well. So we're going to first identify a problem. I want to note that I saw that you guys put a bunch of really great non-program decisions. I've written some down. Hopefully we can work some of those in. We will touch on one or two of these uh, toward the end. But for this, for the sake of this, let's talk about, you know, needing a new car. That's, that's the problem. We don't, you know, maybe our old car broke down. Maybe like me, your air conditioning gave out during July in Virginia when it was 90 degrees and terribly humid and you needed a new car. And so the second thing we do is establish the decision criteria. So for me, I was like, I had this tiny two-door car. I wanted an SUV, a small SUV, although small SUVs are now huge. Uh, I wanted a sunroof. And then just because now I'm at Iowa, let's say we really want a fantastic Iowa yellow car. So third, we weigh these in some way. So SUV is more important. Maybe the sunroof is less important, but again, that IOE yellow is not negotiable. And then we generate some alternatives. Ken, we were talking about some of these this morning. Now for the sake of this, I will not generate all the alternatives, but that's what we assume with the rational decision-making model. You should generate as many alternatives as possible. I'll name four just for the sake of it. Uh, Subaru Forester, Nissan Vogue, Toyota RAV4, and Honda CRV. And those were the four I looked at. Um, Fifth, we, eva we evaluate these simultaneously. This is a really important word to consider. Typically, when we make decisions, now imagine you know, you're deciding on what you want for dinner. We are, we are told an idea, and then you're like, no, I don't want that. Then your friend tells you another one. You're like, no, I don't want that. And they probably then say, fine, you decide, um, or you pick a place. So we typically dismiss these as we hear them, as opposed to accumulating all of them and then assessing them as a group um, based on the, the decision criteria in step three. 
then we choose that best alternative, implement it. And then importantly, this gets lost when we talk about rational decision-making and it will come up again. We evaluate that decision. So this model makes a couple of assumptions, like I mentioned. First, identifying the problem. So in this instance, I identified the problem as needing a new car, but really the problem was I don't have transportation. So if we think about this more broadly, it could be I could buy a new bike, I could take the bus, I could move closer to work. There are other options than just buying a car. By narrowing our framing quite early, we're limiting our options. Second, it, develop, it assumes that we develop an exhaustive list. So I noted only possible small SUVs, but there are other options uh, than small SUVs, right? Even if you're within the small, you skipped over Kia. We just I talked did about skip it over this morning. Where's, where, where's the respect for South Korean uh, car manufacturing? I have a Kia now. I know, Ken, that's on me. I'm sorry. I'll fix it. I'll fix it. So Kia also, I don't know what their equivalent is for a small SUV. It's not the Telegram. What is oh, it? Oh, it's, it's, it's Hyundai. I'm sorry. So Kia or Hyundai. So oh, okay. Tucson, highly recommend. Good call. <laughs> we talked in the hallway before this about this exact thing. Um, so it, it, and again, so again, this exhaustive list. And then the then we have to evaluate it simultaneously. Again, that's a problem for us. We typically don't do that. We typically eliminate as we hear one, hear options that are maybe immediately undesirable and don't meet our criteria um, instead of assessing them as a pool. Uh, fourth, we uh we typically assume that we use accurate information, but we don't. So even though we should be using consumer reports and Kelly Blue Book and other features that, that are objective data, who do we talk to? Talk to our friends and about their experiences with their vehicle, which is fine. But if their vehicle is 10 years old, there are different, uh, different maybe safety standards or new, new amenities with cars that, that make a difference. And then finally, this model assumes that we maximize with this decision every single time. Now, do we do that? Probably not. Um, and we'll talk about this a little bit more. So when we think about these three, we've got rational decision making maybe on one, one end, and then this other called intuitive, which we maybe could put on the other end of the continuum. And, and Ken's going to tell us a little more about that. Yeah, so on the other end of the continuum is intuitive decision making, where uh, in our graphic here, you see there's just a whole bunch of stuff that comes together. Um, there was actually, I was just on LinkedIn, another program decision for me. It's a weekday, I check LinkedIn. Um, and one of my colleagues um, uh, in Boston had reposted a Harvard Business Review piece in 2019 talking about intuitive decision making. Intuitive decision making can and does work as a way to integrate across lots of different information. So the idea with intuitive decision making is that we take in a lot of information. Um, and we synthesize it in ways that maybe we don't understand or can't predict. Um, and in the end, we make a decision because it feels right. It seems right. And in fact, we sometimes refer to that as checking our gut or making a decision from the gut. Now, the reality is we know this is uh, as much about your brain as anything else, but it really does feel holistic. Uh, you're kind of checking your emotional state and your anxiety. Um, and intuitive decision making uh, has been shown to work. However, it also has been shown to lead to really bad outcomes because many of us trust our intuition more than we should. And I'm going to come back to that issue um, in a little bit when we, we synthesize and talk about these. Uh, for now, I want to turn it over to Emily to talk about satisficing, which is our third big picture decision making model. So I love the satisficing model, mostly because that's what we do most of the time, um, and it makes great sense. So this I see as sort of existing between the rational decision making and the, and the intuitive. It's actually a blend of two words, satisfy and suffice, which sort of makes that even more fun. Some word play. Now, a researcher named Hermit, Herbert Simon actually was the one who helped contribute to this the largest. He said, listen, humans really struggle to fully leverage the rational decision-making model because it has such, such stringent assumptions that require maybe resources, either personal resources we, we don't we don't have or, you know, uh, or, or are able to get like accumulating uh, accurate information only. That's really tough to do or exhausting all of the options. That's also really tough to do. And so he said, you know, in ten, we, instead we tend to satisfy or go with this sort of good enough model. Um, and this isn't a bad thing. Let's be really clear. The word satisfy doesn't always land well with us sort of emotionally, but it's not terrible. We do have a finite amount of resources. Simon was correct there. Um, and the environment demands lots of things from us. And so if we can satisfy uh, in lower stakes decisions that can sometimes leave us with the resources we need to maximize in others. 
maximizing, uh, although I really appreciate this model, uh, maximizing all the time in practice is very difficult, if not impossible, and it's exhausting. Now, I certainly don't maximize when I'm shopping for toothpaste. Satisficing is good enough if I get the one or two features uh, or if something is on sale. I'm not a, a brand loyal guy when it comes to toothpaste. Uh, I satisfy and I'm out the door doing the other things that I need to do that day. So we presented these as sort of um, three models along a continuum with, with rational uh, to intuitive and satisficing sort of somewhere in the middle. Um, and um, we're setting this up because we do actually have another model we want to talk about. And it's one that we've created based on our understanding of the research in this area and based on our own successful decision making in our lives. But before we do, I want to make sure that you know I'm not setting these up and, and Emily and I are not saying that these are, are bad. For every season, there is uh, a reason that you might use one of these models. So rational decision-making takes time, but if it's an important decision, some of you were, were talking about some very important decisions uh, about um, you know, big life things um, that you're making. If you're choosing the primary supplier and looking at five-year contracts, for your organization, that is a big decision. And you want to invest the time and energy into doing a rational decision making. Um, if you are dealing with um, negative homeowner association responses, you know, to some extent that depends on how negative they are. I mean, there's this just modest complaints um, and the kind of routine thing, in which case, you might not need to go through and do a big rational decision making. You might just kind of react intuitively if you've dealt with these complaints before. And in fact, that's what intuitive decision making research would say. When you have substantial experience in complicated, potentially emotional environments, um, that experience can be a good guide and can make your intuition, your gut more accurate. But if you're in a new situation, you've traveled to a new country, you started a new business, um, you're interacting with people that are kind of new to you. Your intuition may actually be a misapplication and you might make the completely wrong decision. Um, this happens to me when I travel internationally. If I'm interacting with people on the street or a restaurant and I'm in Korea, um, I, I may make some faulty assumptions based on years and years of eating uh, at restaurants in the United States. So my intuition about how to respond, how to react, how to make a complaint is not going to lead me well when I'm in a new environment. But it does work in certain circumstances. And satisficing, as we've said, can be really valuable for routine, relatively low stakes, uh, everyday decision making, um, where are you going to go out to eat? Um, for example, you absolutely don't need to review Yelp and maximize every time, although I imagine some of you might actually do that. So for every decision-making approach, there is absolutely a season. Now, that said, what we want to talk about, we want to talk about taking the best of each of these approaches to offer for non-program problem-solving situations what we would consider to be um, a really powerful model. And what we're doing is drawing on the strengths of each of these other models. Satisficing, for example, gets you to decisions faster. Intuitive builds on emotions, which do matter in decision-making. And rational pushes you to make sure you've defined the situation and done some research. So here is our model that we're gonna suggest can be very, very powerful for you. And it really is holistically about a process that involves three steps. The first is understanding yourself, know yourself. Now, given our time limits today, most of what we're gonna talk about is about knowing yourself because we know a lot about the limitations of the human brain and the decision-making process and studying and learning and appreciating your limits and your strengths as a decision-maker are really, really important. The, the next step is knowing the situation. Um, if you have transitioned from one job to another and you're in a new culture, you're in a new city, you've got a new boss, that intuitive decision-making may lead you astray. A fast reaction that you have under crisis might actually be the thing that ends up really causing your boss to be frustrated with you. So you gotta know the situation. You need to do your research to understand the organization that you've landed in, what its culture is like, how people make decisions, the preferences that your boss has. So that's the second step. So we know yourself, 
you know the situation. And then the third and final step is where we try to integrate both the rational and the emotional. And this is to combine rational evaluative steps, looking at options, but to include your intuition and emotion in evaluating those. In other words, you might determine that you got three of 20 options that really tend to be best along criteria that you identified, as Emily was saying. We have criteria, we know what we're looking for. At that point, if one of these absolutely just feels wrong to you and it just doesn't resonate with you, it makes sense to integrate evaluation intuition and drop that option off. If you have the time, you might try to figure out why, but at the end of the day, your emotional reaction can be really useful information to integrate and to use so that you're using your whole brain and not just your prefrontal cortex or not just the kind of emotional kind of cerebellum amygdala kind of activity that sometimes leads us into bad decisions. So we're going to dig a little bit more into this. Um, and the way we're going to do this is to think about first knowing yourself. And Emily's mentioned this, and I just want to emphasize it. You know, many of you said, I prefer rational decision making. Um, and Emily has said multiple times as we've gotten to know each other since she came, she loves rational decision making. She makes lists. She uses spreadsheets. She's got weightings. I love it. But she is not actually in many of her decisions fully rational because she's got other things to do, right? She needs to go teach that class. She needs to take vacations. So what happens is as we debate and deliberate, we, we often weight a couple of factors a little bit more than others, and we might even not consider other factors. Um, we're not fully rational when we look at options. She didn't consider key at all. I mean, come on, like don't leave the Korean manufacturers on the table. Let's take a look. And finally, we tend to be a little biased in how likely we believe a decision will be successful. The research suggests, and we're going to get to this in just a minute, using a framework from the Heath brothers, and this is a book, Heath and Heath, that, that some of you all may have seen. It's a fantastic synthesis because they talk about villains, and one of those villains is many of us tend to be overconfident. So let's jump in. To know yourself means to understand the ways in which your brain is not fully rational, even when you're trying to be rational, either in the fully rational decision-making or to integrate some of the rational components into our decision-making model, you should begin by understanding the ways in which you are not fully rational. And the first of those um, is narrow framing. So we have a tendency, and Emily already mentioned this, we have a natural tendency to step into a problem and to already have discarded what might be 10, 20, 30, 100 options. So I'm looking at midsize SUVs. Do you really need a midsize SUV? Like, what about, as Emily said, what about a bike? Um, what about actually a fully electronic vehicle rather than a gasoline powered engine? Have you looked recently to see what they look like? Tesla is not the only model of EV right now. Ford, for example, has gone really deep and is developing fantastic technology in the area of electronic vehicles. Um, we do this all the time. We do it at work. Uh, we'll have somebody who comes to us because they're ill or they have a challenge. And we immediately jump to solving the problem for them and trying to figure out how we can make sure that their work gets done. And sometimes we don't even ask the right question, which is, does the work actually need to be done in our pre-agreed deadline? Um, does the work need to be done actually by our company? Might this be the opportunity to reframe and think about stopping doing something that we don't need to do or outsourcing and having somebody else do it altogether? So this is narrow framing, and we often, often engage in ruling out options before we've considered them. That's number one. Uh, number two is confirmation bias. Um, and did I have you, Emily, is talking about confirmation bias? This is something that you, are you ready to talk about it? Oh, that's right. So Emily is we reminding me. We flipped it a little bit. <laughs> Reminding me with a click of the finger um, <laughs> that I was supposed to talk a little bit about solutions to narrow framing. Thank you. We can we can do it this way. That's fine. Uh, let me let me jump bias. in. 
So, because okay. I love the, these solutions. And again, this this draws from Heath and Heath, and it's a really powerful concept. Um, and, and this is this idea, and you can go ahead, um, Emily, and just click on it. And we'll show people what we think are these great solutions. The first is we have a tendency um, as part of the neuroframing framing is to think in terms of yes or no, rather than to think in terms of partway or halfway. We also um, could change a yes or no question into a how question. So instead of saying um, someone's sick, am I going to force them to get the work done? Yes. Or am I just going to say it's not going to get done on time? No. Yes, no. Well, what about reframing it is, okay, we now have one option that's been taken off the table. This individual will not be able to get the work done on, uh, on time. What's the how? How can we do it? And we engage in collaborative decision making uh, to find out what are the options that maybe I hadn't considered. And this works really well when you pose how questions and you collect new information by asking other people, what do you think about how? So a villain here, narrow framing, there are things that you can do when you know yourself by changing yes or no to maybe or how or maybe partway, and we can add this. Okay, now we'll go on to confirmation bias. Emily, it's you. Sounds good. So confirmation bias, this is maybe one we might be most familiar with. Uh, confirmation bias it tends to be when we seek out sort of uh, confirmations of the assumptions we're already making. Uh, we think about this and we think about how we seek out news sources. We seek out news sources that align with how we think already. And that can that can uh, keep us from under, having a broader understanding of more perspectives. Fortunately, we do have solutions to this that are pretty easily accessible, right? So we really need to challenge your assumptions. One way to do this, I'm going to go back to the car example, and I'll give a personal example that's only marginally embarrassing, um, uh, is, is having people sort of help you understand how you're actually going to go about whatever decision it is. So when I was buying a car two years ago, I was like, I'm going to also get a boat. And that, so I need a car that's going to like, you know, haul a boat. And my dad was like, I, no, you're not going to get a boat anytime soon. And no matter the number of people I talked to, like, that's a really nice dream, Emily, but you're not getting a boat anytime soon. You're working toward tenure and you're busy. Um, so this, joking aside, it was really, really important to talk to people you trust, form a red team, folks who are, who are going to poke holes in the assumptions that you're making about the decision uh, and about the criteria that you've developed, uh, things that you want, like that sunroof or that Hawkeye yellow. Like maybe you don't need these things. Maybe these are keeping you from optimizing or maximizing your decision in some way. But find people you trust to talk about, find a mentor. And these are uh, easily, you know, you can find those in your friends or family or teachers uh, or bosses that you might trust. These are really, really important to, to challenge your assumptions. Did you want to take over short-term emotion? I could talk about it. No? Okay. Short-term emotion. Short-term emotion, which we've talked about. Ken was right to say, listen, short-term emotion does uh, play an important role in our intuition, and it helps us uh, keep us uh, uh, to making safe decisions uh, that, uh, that otherwise might lead us down the wrong path. However, short-term emotion has a sneaky way of making decisions for us without us always realizing it. Um, and so what the big solution here is, is not just even taking stock. It's saying, okay, I recognize that emotions play a role when I'm making a decision. I have to make space for them to happen because I can't stop that from happening. So let them happen, allow them to dissipate, and then keep moving. Um, this is a really important one when we think about early career folks who might be intimidated by an opportunity they, they, they don't feel qualified for. They might think, oh, no, I'm not good enough for that, or oh, I don't have the, the qualifications or, or whatever it might be. You might say no to an opportunity for development, which you shouldn't be doing. So allow yourself to feel that and then move on. That does not need to dictate your life. Yeah, when I when I coach and, and counsel not just undergrads but MBA students on career issues, um, you know, I let them know that anxiety and fear and worry are really valuable uh, emotions, and you shouldn't make a decision just because of them. You should use them to inform you. And and Emily has got, made such a good point here about you know often we have learning opportunities, growth expansion opportunities. Are you going to start a business? And we're going to talk about this in just a minute that you know is going to take some time. And if you're anxious about it because it's uncertain, that's perfectly sensible. You should be. Now the question is, and this is where you want to reframe things a little bit, um, is is that emotion just telling you that there's risk, and Often the biggest decisions, there is risk. 
and you should feel that. So you can reframe things then uh, to address short-term emotion by taking a break, take a walk, get a snack, I always do, uh, and then think about, okay, three years from now when I look back on this, will I tell myself, even if I failed, that that was absolutely a courageous thing to do? Use a different time frame to start to think about whether the anxiety, the fear, the concerns that you have maybe are really just a, a short-term emotion, and uh, it's really going to be worth overcoming that and pushing through. And there's the old saying about courage is not the absence of fear. Um, it is acting with that fear. Uh, and for many of the big decisions we have, it's okay to feel nervous about it. Um, and we just want to make sure we understand why we're nervous about it, reframe a few times to make sure we're not being curtailed, slowed down by a little bit of anxiety that's going to go away 10 minutes from now, a day from now, or two weeks. Emily, back to you. Great. And the last one is overconfidence in the in the future. You'll you'll notice that for each of these, there is a small benefit to to each of these villains. So emotion occurs for a good reason. Even narrow framing helps us because too many options can can be paralyzing. It's called analysis paralysis, and we have a limited set of resources. So each of these does come with a teeny benefit, but you have to manage it. And overconfidence in the future is a great example. Our overconfidence in our own future keeps us going in moments where things are really struggling, where we're really struggling. That's a good thing, especially you can think of, you know, entrepreneurial mindset is really important to be very confident, but dial that back and recognize that failure may occur and the consequences of that, and then create these, these escape routes as needed, um, just to help temper that a little bit, because other people might be involved in your, your consequences. So what we're going to do now, um, now, now that we've sort of talked about this, this new decision-making model that's an integration of prior research and best practice on decision-making, um, we want to go through three scenarios. Um, and as part of this, we're going to ask another poll question. Um, we're going to chat a little bit about application of the model. Now is also a good time if you have questions to open up that Q&A, the question and answers tab, and to go ahead and put them in there. Because Ashley uh, and, and I, as Emily is talking about some of her cool research on side gigs, we can start answering those and queuing those up. So feel free, any questions you have, we're happy to take them. We hope that we'll be able to get to all of them, uh, but go ahead and do that. So Three scenarios. We're going to talk a little bit about, you know, should you sort of start that little side gig? And a side gig could be a volunteer job, or it could be um, a hobby that you're turning into a business, or it could be full fledged. Hey, I'm gonna I'm gonna start an LLC. I'm gonna take this thing on the side, or it could just be that you pick up a part time job that already exists. We want to talk a little bit about funding startup businesses. The University of Iowa Tippie College of Business has a remarkable entrepreneurial center, JPEC, the John Papa John Entrepreneurial Center, that works a lot with startup businesses. So we want to just talk a little bit and use that as an example. And finally, both Emily and I have bought houses within this past year. So we don't know if this will help you, but it's kind of like debriefing and therapy for us to have a little bit of time to talk about buying a house, which is uh, for many of us, one of the biggest personal purchasing decisions we make. Now at work, you might make um, you know, much larger decisions, but for our own finances, often buying a house is a really big decision. So we're going to start off, uh, again, feel free to put some things in the Q&A and we'll come back to those. We're going to start off with taking a side gig. And since Emily's done research in this area, I asked her to talk about this Thank you, Ken. Yeah, we're going to launch a poll. I want to know how many people do have side gigs. I did see this come up as one of the non-programmed decisions uh, about maybe um, maybe starting it up again, which is very exciting. Uh, like I said, this is an area of research I really love. Uh, a couple of us here at the at Tippy do it. Um, uh, uh, many years ago, we called it moonlighting. I think some still call it that, but I think we've taken on side gig uh, re more recently, given sort of our love of the, the term gig economy. So let's see how people are responding. I'm not like we, we do have one person who said they're drowning in cash, and I just wanted to offer there it is. Uh, like to stay afterwards and chat a little bit. We'd be happy to <laughs> talk with you about how to, how to spend that money. It's something <laughs> that we're quite good at here in the TV <laughs> college business. I'm this good at range here. I'm really good range. We'll show this in just a second, but you know, lots of variability in where people are with regard to sidekicks. 
Yeah, this is fantastic. And so applies to many of you. So those of you who have been doing, you know, are doing currently doing a side gig, I want you to think back to when you decided to take on a side gig. Maybe it was COVID. We saw that happen. Maybe it's 10 years ago and you've been doing something on and off for 10 years. Um, those who are thinking about it, this will be a good time to, to work through the framework. And those who don't want to, uh, I hear you. It's a lot of work to, to, do a, to do a side job. Everyone, I think, in this group who's doing it would tell you that. Um, so let's think about this scenario a little bit more. The first thing is knowing yourself, and that really comes down to motivation and capacity. Do you have the time and energy to do more than what you're already doing? I saw some, uh, at least one person in the in the chat mentioned, you know, work life balance. So if this is something you know that's priority to you, perhaps taking on another job is. It's not the right time um, because you already have too many jobs uh, raising raising tiny humans, I imagine. So uh, one villain that plays a role here is confirmation bias. Again, what are the assumptions you're making about time and energy that maybe won't hold? Go and talk to individuals in your life who can help you understand that if you're monetizing a side gig, no, you're not going to make enough jam to sell. No one wants your jam. Maybe you need someone to tell you this. Um, but uh, and if, uh, if that doesn't land, do you have time for the administrative task? Again, I think a lot of the people who are in the room right now who have done side gigs will uh, will tell you there's a lot of admin work associated with side gigs. And do you have the time and capacity for that? I don't mean to dis discourage anyone from making jam. I want to be clear there because I will take it because I love jam. Okay. So talk to the people around you to help you challenge that, that confirmation bias. Next is knowing that situation. What are your options? Again, you can link this to your motivation. If what you would like to do is just make a little bit of extra cash, you may immediately think of ride sharing. Um, is there a market for Uber in Iowa City, uh, Coralville in the surrounding area? I'm not really sure. Um, but why narrow your search to only ride sharing? That's what we typically think of right away as side, as side gigs. We think of Uber. But why? Why narrow your, your search? You might do some additional research and find that not only can you find something that pays well and gives you, you know, that financial satisfaction that you're looking for, but also that you enjoy the tasks, you know, themselves. And that's, that's the goal. We would, we would hope everyone enjoys what, what they're doing. So what this pro approach allows you to do is to broaden those alternatives and not force you to succumb to that narrow framing and, and prematurely dismiss viable options. So the last thing, of course, as Ken was talking about, is you know evaluating and listening to your intuition. So you begin by rationally evaluating your criteria and the options that are available to meet those criteria. And then you think about, well, what do I want to do? What sort of sits right with me? So let's pretend that you are motivated to learn a new skill uh, and investigate an, a new career. So with this long-term focus, that long-term orientation, you may not immediately maximize economically, but that's okay because you're developing a skill for a future purpose and that sits right with you uh, and your instincts. So I've, we've talked about side gigs a little bit. In research, uh, when you're, when you're uh, trying to build a side gig into an entrepreneurial venture, we actually call this hybrid entrepreneurship. And so Ken's going to talk a little bit about how you might think about the ways of funding that. Yeah, so let's, let's play this out. And for those of you who've been successful, uh, and are maybe looking to scale, or for those of you um, who are needing some success and you're thinking, okay, I'm now at this, this precipice and I have to decide to get to the next peak, um, I'm going to need capital. I'm going to need somebody to help me out. So um, again, you have to begin with knowing yourself because the funding options for you depend heavily on kind of what you already know, who you already know, and what your tolerance is for risk related to your own income. So um, is it possible that you know you could end up being um, really low on cash for a while and survive both personally and as a business? Um, I've worked with student entrepreneurs who picked up, left, went to Chicago, started a business, hired a few people, and they ended up living in the closet of a friend as a result of just not having enough cash coming out of the business to pay rent in Chicago. So, and you should know yourself, like he was okay doing that. Um, I don't know why he got a big dog. That was a bad idea um, because the big dog and him in the closet was a little crazy, but he knew himself well enough to know that he's okay living in the closet. Uh, and the dog didn't have a vote, but he made that work too. So know yourself uh, is, is first. Then you step into knowing the situation. 
Um, and this is where it's really important to know your competitive environment, sort of know what the economic conditions are, know, as we've started to talk about in the chat, about given the nature of your business, what's the type of cash flow that it's likely to have? Because that situation really changes who you should be talking to. Um, and you want to think about kind of who it is out in the market that has capital um, that's going to be expensive excited to be partnering with you. Um, and this could be that you're working and you're able to find uh, angel investors or venture capitalist firms or funds. Uh, it may be that you're nervous partnering with somebody else who's going to have a share of your business. So instead, um, knowing that about yourself and knowing the situation, you might compete for one, five, 10, 20, $25,000 in some of our local business plan competitions. Know that environment, the competitive environment, and, and the kinds of things that are swirling that create potential opportunities. And, and you know this, and this is just a way of integrating within this model, but you cannot negotiate effectively with a venture capitalist or with a bank if you're looking for a more standard commercial loan, unless you know the situation well. You need to have done your market research to understand whether or not you're getting a good deal and you need to keep asking around. So then we move to evaluate and intuit. And for some folks, this is such a big decision. Um, you know, you really want to think through knowing yourself and knowing the situation to figure out um, what is the best way to go. Um, and here, because this is often your, your livelihood, your energy, your ideas, this might be a passion project for you. You do want to recognize the emotion that's involved and acknowledge it, understand it, and integrate that with your more rational work. Um, many of you may decide that you would be much happier starting small with uh, a bank loan or by self-funding your business because you don't want to get into a really deep contractual relationship with other people. And that can be a very powerful decision to make. And you wanna make sure you take the time to evaluate and intuit, are you doing that for the right reason? Not because you're scared, but because you are really wanna have the control. Um, and I have worked with many entrepreneurs who have been uh, cautious not to create a nonprofit because you have to bring in a board of directors not to bring a, an angel or a VC because all of a sudden you have a pretty strong voice in your ear about what you do. And instead, they've actually worked with local banks. Uh, and you'll be surprised that many of the community banks, um, if it's not this huge long run risk, um, many of the local community banks, certainly here in Iowa City, want to help you. Um, and, and, and you may be able to do something. Um, never use a personal credit card. Good rule of thumb. You don't need to investigate that, uh, but working with a bank on a commercial loan uh, once you have incorporated can absolutely be a reasonable way forward. So know yourself, know the situation, evaluate it into it. This gives you a way of thinking a little bit about how to fund that successful startup that you might already have, or based on today, maybe you're now starting to think about getting started, and we would encourage you to take steps forward doing that. All right, we have a third scenario. Third scenario with a poll. With a poll. So let's the jump poll. in with the poll. So this is about buying a house, which thank you, Ashley. Like Ken said, we have both recently done in the last 12 months. So it's my first home. So during the pandemic, which was chaos and honestly a little fun. <laughs> chaos have, fun. Yeah, yeah. Which house is this for you, Ken? What number? Um, so uh bought one, built one, and now we're on our third. Um, that we bought, uh, and and we'll talk in just a second a little bit about that process. Mm -hmm. So um, so the majority of you, it looks like, are, are not on the market. Um, so and and might consider, but are not on the market. Um, mm -hmm. So and there's five of you. So six percent are actively looking. So our hearts go out to you uh, who are actively looking. We have been through this process. We know that it can be um, really exhausting, exciting, and exhausting at the same time. And you can apply the model we've been talking about. Know yourself, know the situation, evaluate into it. And there's a caveat to this that we'll get to in just a minute. Emily, do you want to start with your process? Yeah. So we started with know yourself, which because this was um, our first house, it became a sort of 
uh, pretty silly list of things we wanted. Uh, we ended up in a home that we didn't really expect we would really like. It has a lot of blonde wood, which I didn't know would be on a no list ever, but it's now on a no list, but it's there and we love it. So what we started out wanting is, is you know, we wanted a two-story house with a huge uh, front porch and uh, a three-car garage. Um, it turns out in Iowa, again, this is knowing your situation, which we didn't entirely know. It's just bad research. Don't tell anyone I said that. But uh, there are a lot of hills <laughs> and you build on hills, which means you have a lot of ranch walkouts, which we have come to really love. But in the beginning, we had this sense that we just wanted this two two story house with a basement because that's what we had in Indiana. Um, so that was our big, our big challenge and, and short-term emotion played a, played a big role and can play a big role in the house hunting process. And we had things built in, my partner and I had things built in to say, okay, after we saw a house, we didn't force it right away. We said, what do we really think if this isn't what we wanted? We, we, we didn't bid on many houses, which was fine because we had several that were outbid from us quite frequently. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah, you were in a, you were in the hot market. So yes, um, we were. Yeah. So um, uh, my wife and I, Amy Christoph Brown, and I have been married um, uh, mostly happily for many, many years. Um, and we were looking at houses and we had lots of conversations um, about the know yourself. And unfortunately, we didn't fully agree on everything. So one of her top criteria was pool. And one of my top criteria was no pool. So that creates um, what academics refer to as a non-overlapping set of Venn diagrams related to options. Um, so, um, and, and this is part of what's interesting, and here's the caveat with um, many decisions, but certainly one uh, where you're buying a new house and you have a partner. And that's that the know yourself is really know yourselves. Um, and, and being willing to talk about, um, exactly. So Allison, this is exactly what we're, we're suggesting here, and we should modify the language on the slide, is really understanding collectively what it is um, that matters to you and having that conversation. And I'm not suggesting that this will be resolved immediately, but it's important to be open about it and to spend time talking about it. And this also plays into knowing the situation because you want to be looking together um, in the case of a house with a partner, in the case of a business with business partners, to research the situation. Because only if you're doing some of the research together will you start to reach some of the same conclusions about what the competitive environment is like. And boy, our competitive environment for houses has been up and down here, even in what is a typically pretty calm market um, in Iowa City. And it was important to know um, the difference between last December, this March, and this December. They were very, very different markets. So knowing the situation was absolutely critical. Emily, you want to say a word about the, the evaluating and intuiting and how you all did that? Yeah. So, you know, it ordinarily, the advice we got from others was, you know, really give into that gut check, go and walk around the house, see how it feels. Um, and while I would probably ordinarily support that, we ended up buying ours virtually, which didn't, we ended up loving the house. There is a little bit of maximum, you know, um, increasing your commitment, escalating your commitment after you've made a, made a decision, which we don't get into in this lecture. Um, but that can be really important for you to go and, and that's your gut check. Does this feel right? Do, you know, does the layout work for me? Does it not? Is it facing the direction I like? Is the sun going to come in and blast me in the eyes when I'm working at my desk at a certain time of day? These are things that you need to know and feel out. And so in this case, that emotion can play a role instead of immediately, I like it, I don't. It's, does this feature work for me or not? And that has an emotional element. So when we were evaluating and following our intuition on this, it, those were some of the big things that mattered to us. Um, so the best that we could evaluate them uh, with our realtor being walking around with the camera. Hard decisions, uh, hard decisions. And uh, when you're, you're buying a house with multiple people, um, but it, it is important. And I did want to address um, one of the questions we got um, in the Q&A um, was about sort of the balance between uh, a family held business and your personal business and thinking about sort of how you move money. Might you move money from one to the other? Um, and what I said in the answer to the Q&A was um, there are some tax implications. Um, so we're going to be very cautious there um, and we can bring in our, our accounting colleagues. But we want to say a word um, just about process, which is that in these cases, the decision-making process is as 
buying a house was for Emily and I, a collaborative one. So you have yourself and your spouse, um, but you also have um, uh, the person who is sort of coordinating and working your tax strategy. Um, and you might actually have someone helping tax strategy on the home side as well as on the business side. And coming together to go through a process and having a conversation about who are we, um, what, what's the nature of this decision we're trying to make, in effect, knowing yourself as a business and as a, as a home entity, and then talking about the economic conditions, is now the time to move money? Is now the time to extract sort of value or cash out of a family-owned business based on economic conditions? Um, and then you will have gone through a process with multiple people who have expertise. Then you've got some great intuition at play, but you also really want to evaluate um, how you might go about getting the resources to do the work you want to do in your own home. Uh, and in fact, if you reframe the whole thing as how and involve the same people, how are we going to get a house that looks the way we want with a home office, then you might actually come up with more options um, beyond just pulling money out of the family business. Um, that was more true when interest rates were lower. So you may not have a lot of options uh, uh, knowing the situation, but it is absolutely worth thinking about what you're doing as a, as a collaborative decision-making process and engaging other people. So we say, know yourself, know the situation, evaluate into it, into it. But in many, many decisions, it's so important to do it together. And, and this is not just doing the last step together. Um, it is so important to spend time talking. And Amy and I did this. We talked about the house a lot. Maybe too much for my preference, but what it led us to do is to really understand each other and to understand what our preferences were. It led us to understand the situation because we were constantly revisiting things. Uh, and as Amy aptly points out, it was a two-year process, uh, and there was some going back and forth. In the end, you know, we wound up with a lovely home, one that we are happy with every element of it. Uh, in particular, it doesn't have a pool. Um, so that's maybe I, I got a little bit on that end, but Amy does love the house. So Laura, you asked that question. I'll turn it to Amy in the chat. She can answer whether she's happy with our process and our final decision. Two years, uh, but I think we've landed well. So we only have a couple minutes left, maybe time for uh, maybe two questions if you've got them. The big question was the pool, Ken, let's be clear. There were at least two people who asked. We're going to hotels with nice yeah. pools. <laughs> uh, and that's what I keep saying. The best <laughs> pool is someone else's pool. Um, so, so we have no questions. Um, uh, please know that Emily and I are excited uh, about the time that we spent together. I love these alumni webinars. It's great to see names of folks that I've had a chance to teach over the years. Uh, here's a name that I know. Dylan, you say you have a question. Um, easiest way to pose that is to put it in the Q&A. Um, so, and then we'll take a look at that. Um, but please know that as, as we look at this last question, we are happy to continue the conversation. Uh, Emily, thank you for the positive feedback. I was just talking about um, our, our teaching experience in London and Dublin uh, to some uh, folks trying to convince them that they should do a, a GLOW. Uh, oh, and Val uh, confirmed that the best pool is your neighbor's pool. Yeah, I agree. We've got a, a question from Katie. Do you have any thoughts on buying a condo versus a single family home? Oh, so this is a great question because actually this very much plays into kind of know yourself. What is it that you're looking for in a home? Um, you know, and knowing the situation because in certain areas, condos are horrible investments. They just don't resell. Um, does that mean they're a bad investment for you? No, because you're think about yourself. Are you likely to want to sell in a couple of years? Um, if you are likely to sell, are you okay losing a little bit of money? Uh, the issue with condos is often that depending on the market, um, they are you're, you're going to lose money in the short term and even more than you would uh, with a more expensive home. Uh, you have to understand what is your risk tolerance? What are you willing to potentially lose? What is it that you're looking for in that 
purchase um, and then really look at that market because there are some markets actually where condos are doing really well. I just haven't found one. Most of the markets I've worked in, condos would not be a good investment. Emily, did you have a thought on that question? Yeah, I actually really liked this this comment of do you do you like to mow grass or shovel snow? And that's that's a good question. What do you you know? If you are willing to yeah. do those things, then maybe a house is fine. But if you really hate those things, then stick to a condo. If you don't like hearing your neighbors, maybe go with a house. That was for yeah. us. We were tired of apartment living. I want to oh, jump in. Yeah, please. Sorry, it's Ashley. Um, I just want to jump in because there is actually a, a decent question or a good question in the um, chat. And do you feel, so I don't know, Ken, if you want to take a look at it, it's from Dylan. Buying a house is a large decision where you talk to a number of professionals. Do you feel the most worrisome decision making is the small decision that we continue to make day to day? Oh, not thinking good. about the need yeah. to apply more rational versus intuition, or is it just a big decision? Yeah, this is kind of the kind of question I would expect from Dylan. This is a very thoughtful <laughs> question. Um, and what he's what he's hinting at is is the idea that often we make a lot of program decisions. And, and maybe you're not hinting, you're just, just making sure this is a good lesson that we end on. We often make a lot of program decisions. It's what we think we're supposed to do and we just keep doing it. Um, the reality is that it is useful to pull back and some, I, I know very successful people who do this sort of on a quarterly basis. Some people do it with an annual retreat. But pull back and ask yourself, am I making the wrong program decisions? Is my, you know, getting up and going to work every day at this job the right thing for me? Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And one way to deal with this, which is really interesting, is to sit down and create um, triggers or red flags for yourself that are conditions and experiences that you might have that should cause you to rethink major life decisions. Um, and if you set these up in a moment where you're really thinking um, and you're, you're trying to um, almost uh, create a plan for yourself, then you've created a program that is a set of rules that helps you decide when it's time to blow up your existing program decisions. So Dylan, I appreciate you mentioning this. We've kind of dealt in the realm of programmed versus non-programmed, but the reality is sometimes we need to break out of our quote programming and get into situations where we're uncomfortable and we follow this process, get to know ourselves, to know the situation, and maybe make a big change. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, I appreciate that. Um, we have some other great suggestions. Andrew, thank you for that. Um, and John, um, John knows a lot about the local real estate market. Appreciate your comments there as well. So here's to Ashley for our wrap up. Yes. Well, thank you both, um, Ken and Emily. And thank you to everyone for attending the Tippy webinar series presentation, How to Make Smarter Decisions, Research-Based Recommendations for Innovative Problem Solving. When the event ends in just a moment, you will see that quick survey that I mentioned earlier. We'd be grateful if you could share your thoughts and help us make virtual programming even better in the future. I do want to take one moment to note to acknowledge the Tippy Leadership Collaborative. You see that slide on your screen right now. Um, this is one of our newer initiatives within the Tippy College of Business. Ken, do you want to give a quick, quick <laughs> shout Absolutely. out? Absolutely. Um, so we hired Stephen Corey back from. Texas A&M, where they do a lot of exec ed, and he's helped build up our practice. I teach in this program. It is a fantastic opportunity. Um, if you would love to engage with Tippy um, and the alumni webinars, uh, great, but not enough, and you don't want to come back and get another degree, which we would recommend, by the way, in between those two uh, extremes are opportunities to work with us for customized executive education, uh, guest speakers. I've had a chance to talk to a number of local businesses. We love it. It's a great opportunity to stay connected. Uh, we also do deeper collaborative partnerships where we uh, develop long-term sort of relationships to help you solve major development needs. Uh, happy to work with you. Stephen and Allison are amazing. Feel free to contact them or you can contact me. Yes, and their contact information is on that slide. So please reach out there. It's a wonderful program. We're so happy to have Steve and Allison and all of our faculty who are a part of the TLC um, participate. So on that note, on behalf of the Tippy College of Business, thank you for joining us this afternoon. We wish you a wonderful holiday season. And as always, go Hawks.